So what I did is I looked at your Twitter page. Oh Twitter God, page. I've stopped tweeting like two years ago, I think. So really, but there's yeah, there's stuff on there, but it's just basically push stuff. Are you sure? I think so. Because I had to look through there to look. I, what I like to do is, yeah, you know, I can come on and I can tell you what he's going to come and talk about. But he's going to talk about it anyway, so there's no fun in that. True. And what I like to do is just make speakers stand on the stage for a few minutes going, oh, God, what did I say? <laughs> oh, <laughs> what God, did what I did I do? say? So may maybe this is two-year-old data and I didn't notice it. But it certainly said May. Oh, that could be, yeah. He, he's into tech. He likes Google Glass. He's going to talk to him about beacons. But actually, the average of the last six runs that he took... Oh, there Whether you go. I, I do publish that. Okay, yeah. so that is up to date. Yeah, All that right. is up to date. So yeah, he you wouldn't say to, it looking at me. He likes to run, on average, 6.36 kilometers a day based on his last six runs. Ladies and gentlemen, please <laughs> make him feel warm, welcome here on the entrepreneurship stage to help you. This is Mr. Remco Braun. Thank you. I need to update my Twitter page because uh -huh. I still have a Google Glass picture there. That's, that's you, just you, not good. You do. <laughs> so I'm here to talk to you about a little bit about Beacons, a little bit about our company that, that we started. We are, um, as I like to say, a very small company with ridiculously large clients. And there's an interesting way of, of getting to that point where you can actually draw really large clients with, with a small company by just doing really cool stuff. And that's kind of um, uh, kind of what we're trying to do and uh, what we're trying to get at. When we entered the Beacon space, um, it was about two and a half years ago, we, we were introduced to it uh, at South by Southwest and, and we saw it and we, we we first of all we saw that uh, it was supported by both uh, Google and uh, and Apple, so we knew it it had the potential to become big. But it also solved a problem um, by being able to connect online with offline, and and by doing that, we thought, well, this is this is cool to build a company around. And, and one of the things that I found out because we I did have a few companies before this, uh, mainly in the online video space. And what I found out is if you do something really cool and n not many other people are doing it, and you're right on that, that bubble where it's, it's kind of being hyped, um, uh, you're getting a lot of calls from, from big companies wanting to do something with you. And that's, that's kind of what we use, used to break through, and um, that's what we did um, with Beacons on Sale. Um, uh, for those of you that are not from the Netherlands, anyone that's in the Netherlands knows what Sale is. But if you're not from here, Sale is uh, an event held every five years. Uh, and it's the biggest event in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, it draws more than two million people in five days. And basically, people look at ships. That's it. There's old ships, and you'll see some pictures of them, new ships, and, and a lot of ships. Come into Amsterdam. It's a big party around looking at ships, and it's, it's, it's actually pretty cool. Um, so anyway, my name is Remco. I'm co-founder of, uh, of InBeacon. So... Um, First, I want to just bring everyone kind of up to speed, and there might be people that know a lot about beacons, might be some of you that are not completely aware of what it is. Just quickly, what are beacons? Beacons is, is part of Internet of Things. What it basically does, it, it makes, um, makes, makes it possible for your uh, smartphone, or no, really, for your app on the smartphone to react to its environment. But interestingly enough, we haven't done this on sale, but I'll, uh, if you have the time, I, I can show you some, some other examples of this. You can also make with beacons the environment adapt to you. So um, uh, what that does is close a loop between online and offline. You can actually start knowing if people enter a store, enter an event space, where they're located. And this is exactly what we do, what we've done uh, in online since... Uh, even before the, the millennium, this is this is called cookies. And basically, what um, what beacons are, or um, what you can use it for, is for it to be an offline cookie. So you can actually track where people go, what they do, and based upon that information, you change um, either what type of message they get on the phone, or what they see around them, uh, things like that. So so that's that's what we're doing. Um, very quickly, beacons are um, are just very simple Bluetooth um, devices. They cost anywhere between ten and thirty dollars, um, uh, and all they do is basically broadcast a signal with an ID. And what the app on the smartphone can do is see how far away they are from that signal. You do that in three rings; it's uh, far, near, and immediate. 
and uh, the, furthest, uh, the farthest ring is about 30 to 50 meters. Um, uh, the near ring is a couple of meters, and, um, uh, and immediate is when you kind of hold, um, uh, hold your phone up to a beacon. So in these, uh, in these rings, you can do different proximity actions based upon where you are in that proximity. And all those proximity actions, they create a lot of insight. They create basically analytics. And we use those analytics within our, within our platform to do different actions. So one of the um, typical actions that you saw in the beginning was uh, relevant push, uh, so push messages. Um, first thing that a lot of people did was just send a push message whenever they saw a beacon. Well, if you do that, a lot of people are going to get annoyed with you because that's not relevant to that person at that time. It feels like spam. So what we do, we use analytics to really see what is relevant to that person at this time and then send them, uh, send them a message. But where the real fun comes in is when you play with things like dynamic signage or, or client selling screens. With dynamic signage, it's possible when somebody, for example, walks into a store, based upon their profile, is to change the signage around them. So um, uh, if you go, for example, to uh, a store that sells mobile phones, and you purchase the latest and greatest mobile phone because it was advertised to you on a big screen, um, uh, you enter that same store in a week, it'll have the same advertisement on there, right? But it's not applicable to you anymore because you already have that phone in your pocket. So what the phone store should do is know that and then change the dynamic signage based upon your profile to show you accessories or, or a case or a way if you buy um, a Samsung a uh, S7, a way for you to fix the screen because usually they're very slippery and they fall out of your hand. Um, Anyway, that's kind of a gripe. Uh, we can also do that with clienteling, and this is more of a customer service thing where somebody walks into a hotel and we can see who that person is, what their booking is. So um, uh, it's not the question that they usually ask is, hello, what's your name, can I? But then they will say, hello, Remco. I see we have you booked for two nights, etc." So this is a new way of interacting with customers. And lastly, um, remarketing and retargeting. Uh, remarketing and retargeting, they are used both used for sometimes uh, uh, different things, but uh, what they really mean is remarketing is talking to your customer in, um, uh, in your own ecosystem. Retargeting is in another ecosystem. Um, what it is with remarketing, you could say, for example, if you've been looking in, an, uh, in a store at a dishwasher uh, and you walk out of the store without passing the cash register, that means you haven't been converted in the store. You haven't bought that dishwasher. Usually 90% of the people don't buy that dishwasher because they go home, they check online the prices, and then they, um, uh, they buy it online. So what you can do with beacons is sense that, and based upon that, uh, those analytics, you can actually retarget or remarket those people and send them a newsletter, for example, um, uh, showing them exactly the dishwashers they were looking for and trying to convert them to, uh, to your online store and actually having them buy that same dishwasher on your, on your website. Um, with retargeting, it's really within media apps. So, for example, we're, um, uh, our technology is used by the Telegraph app, which is installed uh, uh, on phones of around anywhere between 2 and 3 million people in the Netherlands. It has about a million uh, active users every week. Um, and what happens is when you pass a specific beacon, we can retarget based upon uh, on your profile, based upon that you were there, we can retarget you an advertisement. So you walk into a supermarket, that supermarket can buy an ad specifically for people who have entered their supermarket. And this sounds kind of like, oh well, uh, are you spying or not? This is a fully opt-in opt -in situation. There is no personal data being served. It's, it's an opt-in uh, technology. Um, and what the cool thing is for media companies, we're really solving a big problem because nobody is clicking mobile ads. Nobody's clicking mobile ads because they're not relevant to us. And if you ask, ask around, um, people who clicked on mobile ads, it's usually by mistake. You're scrolling down, oh crap, I clicked an ad, right? So what we're trying to do is, um, uh, is trying to fix that broken model by being more relevant. Um, there's, there's one company that's become big in that, uh, that was Google, and I wouldn't mind being the next Google. But anyway, um, so we're, we're using this and, and, and we're trying to create a business model for this. Specifically what we do, we are just a platform. So we're a software as a service. We don't make beacons. We don't sell beacons. We use beacons that are already there or uh, people can buy different types of beacons. Um, uh, we integrate in an app with an SDK. I'll, I'll get to questions in, is, is that okay? Okay. Um, 
uh, we, uh, we integrate in existing apps or in new apps with a very simple to integrate SDK. Um, we generate a personal profile and we uh, can hook into external systems. So for example, we can talk with API to Salesforce and to, to other systems as well. We are not a data company, meaning we do a lot with data, but the data is always the customer's data. So we don't actually extract the data or sell the data or do anything with the data. For us, that was a very important point when we started this company because um, uh, there, is, there is already a lot of platforms out there that sell consumers' data, and we see a lot of media companies and big brands steer away from that. Before I dive into uh, sale, I'm going to answer your question. Yeah, privacy. Will you, will you repeat the yeah, question? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to repeat the question. Cool, thanks. So what about privacy? That's your question, right? Yeah. So what Beacon technology is, it's, it's an opt-in technology, meaning I can only sense what you're doing if, first of all, you have a specific app installed that is connected to my beacons and connected with my platform, and you've given me um, access to location services. So there's, there's two things that you need to ask the consumer, and um, what, I've, what I've noticed is that, uh, uh, especially large media companies, do really take care of, of doing that the right way, right? So they really have an onboarding and telling you why they're doing this. Um, no, because uh, if if you've been near a beacon, what was the, the question? Sorry, the, sorry, you're right. Keeping me sharp. No worries. The question the question was, uh, do telegraph users know this? Because nobody knows this. But sir, you're wrong. No, um, you're right because a lot of people already gave location services because they use it for the weather, for example, or for traffic information. Um, but specifically, the Telegraph um, uh, said, if you are retargeted by a beacon, we sense you've been past the beacon. Only then we ask you for, again, to give the OK to be able to use that information. If you say no, then they do not use the information. If you say yes, then you get more relevant advertising. So they, they're really careful about this. And that's, for me, that was a refresher because I thought, you know, everybody's spying on everyone, right? But they're, uh, they're doing a pretty good job in keeping, keeping things clear. And it's always hard to explain it to people, but we do as good a job as we can. We don't have a whole list of things that you have to squirrel through. It's just in plain Dutch. So it's uh, more, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to do questions if you don't mind. No worries. In which case, I will walk around with a microphone and make it a <laughs> bit easier for you. Hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> we got all the time in the world. What's your name and what's your question? And uh, what's your runkeeper stats? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Sander, I'm a student at the Vrije Universiteit. Um, so why would anyone want to opt in if the only purpose of that is get good better question. advertisement? Good question. That's up to the companies to decide how are you going to, because you're getting something back, right? You're getting data back. So, so that's worth something. But they need to think, and, and that's something that we uh, talk to big brands and, and, and big media apps as well. You need to give something back to the consumer. So that's either a much better, uh, better um, uh, experience in the app. So, for example, less advertising, only relevant advertising. Um, but really what it comes down to when it's really consumer 101, you give away something for free. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Do you want discount? Yes. Give your uh, information, then we'll give you a discount. And it's... It's sad that it has to be that way, but 90% of the people really react to that and, and, and really works, uh, works like that. But we're, we're constantly trying to, so for sale, and it's a good bridge to, uh, uh, to, to segue to the sale case. For the sale case, it was very relevant because you could get information about what's happening around you in the sale app without you having to look through all types of different information and such. So in that case, it's, it's, very, it's very clear. So uh, I got a question. I just wonder how many people in the audience love advertising coming at you? Nobody. See, I find that really weird. I want to be advertised at. Yeah, but you want relevant advertising. So I got a couple of things. Please make it beautiful. Make it look like that backdrop. And you'll get my attention, right? Yeah, that's Two. the, the, the we transfer. Uh, right? Uh, Two. Yeah. Make it relevant to me. I am not in the market for buying tampons. So there's no point advertising them to me, right? And it's not that difficult to figure it out. Yeah. And three? But the, the, the thing is, what we're trying to do is, you visited 
a Victoria's Secret store, so we're going to advertise Victoria's Secret to you. But that's probably okay, because if I went to Victoria's Secret, there's probably a reason for it. Exactly. So it's that's that's what you want at that and, point. And, and I'm going to let you figure out what that was. Maybe <laughs> it was for my girlfriend. Maybe it's just something I'd like to do on a Saturday. It doesn't matter. That's fine. It doesn't matter to me. So, I don't judge. So, one, make it beautiful. Two, make it relevant. And then thirdly, please just don't interrupt me. Yeah, we don't. And, and that's something, that's, exactly. that's a good thing. Uh, the Telegraph, also for you, we cannot send push messages because push messages are for breaking news only, right? If you get a push message, buy more uh, Victoria's sure. Secret stuff. <laughs> sure. You're going to be like, oh, what the hell? I'm going to throw this app away and I'm going to install some other app that doesn't do that. So now I'm going to flip the question around. Now if I promised you advertising would be beautiful, relevant, and never interrupting you, would you be a bit more open to receiving it? Right? Of course you would, because all of a sudden it makes sense. We have a question. No, he's saying, he's saying yes. Oh, he's saying yes. <laughs> okay. it, was, it was like, so <laughs> yes, 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 evangelized. Okay. Back all to right. the story. Let's go to sale, right? So what did we do at, um, uh, at sale? The case was like this. The app was being developed. There's 110 ships coming to Amsterdam, and this was the user experience. You would go to a ship. You would either see the name of the ship or you would kind of look at what it looked like and then you browse through 110 uh, names or pictures of ships to see what ship that is. You click that page and then you look at the information. What we propose is what if you walk by a ship, the first time you see that ship you get a notification, only if you want to, it's opt-in again, only if you want to, saying this is this and this ship and uh, this is the information about that ship. We didn't do it with all 110 ships. It was about, I think, anywhere between 12 and 15 ships we did it with. Um, uh, and it was really a big hit because people were asking, and this is the best feedback you can have, because the biggest complaint we got, why doesn't this work on more ships? Because people really liked getting that information at the right moment, at the right time. So to give you a little bit of background on, on the whole um, uh, sale case, uh, 2.3 million visitors in uh, about five days. We use about 232 beacons. In uh, we use five different beacon networks, which I'll get into a little bit later to to show you what type of beacon networks there are. Um, we use different types of hardware, six types of beacons. Um, we use three different apps, mainly the sale app to do all the interaction, but we also use a telegraph app to do some measuring. Um, and we did uh, in five days. We had about 8.6 million interactions. Now these are not push messages. These are just us seeing that people are walking past a specific beacon. So um, uh, we did a lot of interactions. A lot of people were walking past our beacons. Talk about the app. Um, we had in five days, it's not our app, by the way. We're not an app builder. Somebody else, Xeed, built this app. Um, uh, it had six, uh, 66,000 installs uh, during sales, so during the five or six days that it was available. Um, mainly iOS downloads, um, uh, and that's, that has a reason. I'll, I'll get into that later because it's kind of it's kind of a cool story. Well, it's a sad story, really. 47% um, uh, of the people has Bluetooth turned on uh, uh, standard. So we need Bluetooth to be turned on uh, for, it for this to work. So um, during the installation, people would get, um, uh, get the queue to please turn on Bluetooth if you want to use this service. Uh, if people don't turn it on, they will just not get any messages and we won't measure anything, right? So, so Bluetooth is a big thing for us. The reason why Android was so low was because of the police. Um, the police said um, uh, three months before sales started, listen, we don't want none of that internet thing going around, right? So um, if you build a sale app, great. Uh, they didn't say it to us, they said it to Exceed. Um, a sale app is great to have, but um, it should not almost not use the internet. So what uh, Xeed had to do is put every, uh, every information about the ship had to be in the app, but also high-res photos, because with these uh, retina screens, I mean, they're really huge photos on a small screen, but you know, they're gonna look grainy, and you want pretty, pretty pictures of, of your ships. So this uh, app, this monstrosity of an app, which is a beautiful app, you can still download it, but it was 99.7 MBs large. Why 99.7? That's the threshold for it to be able to be downloaded by 3G internet, so by mobile internet. Um, the thing we didn't count on, or they didn't count on, is that on Android, that threshold is 50 MB. 
Um, so that's why you got like all types of messages like, are you sure you want to download this? Uh, you need to connect to Wi-Fi to download this, etc. You need to run through or walk through a lot of hoops to, to get it downloaded. So that was, that was kind of the sad thing about the police getting involved. Um, what was uh, uh, what was even more uh, interesting is that a week before, uh, all types of live streams were added to the app, um, which take up a lot of bandwidth. So it was really it was all for nothing. But anyway, um, this is the sail in parade. This is the moment when ships um, uh, travel from from the ocean from Eymuiden to Amsterdam through the uh, North Sea Canal. And, and what happens during this is that a lot of people sit on, um, uh, on the banks of the canal looking at the ships coming by. About 500,000 people, because the weather was great, were on the banks of the canal. And what we were able to do, because this distance from this tall ship to the bank, at some points is 250 meters, sometimes even wider. So there was no way for us to reach that with a normal beacon. What we did find, however, were long-range beacons. And long-range beacons are able to broadcast 300 meters. What they do is basically, um, uh, what a normal beacon does is, is send out a, a round signal. What they do is they, they push that into a kind of a cone shape. So you can actually uh, target these to a specific uh, area. So what we did, we um, uh, installed two long-range beacons on the hull of the ships, um, sending the, the signal right to the banks. And then the cool thing was, when the ship came by, uh, people would get the message of the ship coming by. So it was kind of weird because it was a moving beacon and people were standing still. Usually it's the other way around. Um, but the nice thing is, and that's why I told that whole story about um, all of the information being in the app already, this could be completely offline. People didn't have to be connected to the internet because all you saw was a Bluetooth signal. It triggered the right message in the app, and then um, uh, the app would open, and it would just show the message because the or uh, the information because it was already in the app, so it was completely offline. Uh, this was a whole ordeal, by the way, because at that point when we tried to uh, get them, they were still kind of experimental. We finally found some kind of shady guy that knew a lot about these things in Italy, and we finally got around to getting them. Um, they don't look as sexy as Estimo beacons. This is this is a long-range beacons. They're very very are atrocious to look at. But um, one of the cool things that we did, and we kind of broke the rules here because we said we weren't going to do anything with live video, uh, we did eventually. Um, we put a, a nest cam in uh, one of the tall ships that was sponsored by uh, Staatsloterij, which is a, a big lottery company here in the Netherlands, uh, one of the companies that paid us for this pilot. Um, and uh, we hooked it up to a Wi Fi station, so it broadcasted the signal. And friends of ours are actually somewhere in front of here with two long-range beacons on a very small boat. They were um, uh, going in front of it, and uh, they were sending out the signal to the people on the side uh, uh, that were on, on the banks of the canal. And you would get a message, look right now, uh, try to find yourself on the live stream of the ship that's coming by right now. So um, we were getting this live stream to the people while they were standing on the banks of the canal. And th that, was, that was pretty cool. But innovation always hurts. So you, you walk into things or you run into things that, that you don't really understand. And then suddenly you're like, oh, yeah, it's really easy to solve. This is the Etoile du Roi. The Etoile is uh, a ship that looks very old. And it's actually built in the late 90s uh, for the series Horatio Hornblower. But it was a very big deal for the SIL organization to have this ship because it played a big part in the Michiel de Ruiter movie that came out here in the Netherlands. So the Etoile had beacons on it. Um, but what happened is every, every ship parked uh, sideways um, uh, to show it really well. The Etoile, however, parked like this. And the beacons are on the hull. So the beacons are right here. And they're broadcast to the other side of the, of the canal. So you would be walking on the other side of, the, of this, uh, 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 of, of whatever that is. It's not a canal, but it's uh, of the other side of the water. And you would get a message. You're now looking at the Etoile du Rob, but you couldn't see it. Um, so that went kind of wrong for about two or three hours, and then we were notified of it. So we turned off the beacons on, on the hull, um, and we pl actually placed small beacons down here so we could get that um, information correctly. But it's like, uh, it's those things that you run into. You think, how did I, there was no way of us thinking about this. This is uh, a marine ship, Michiel de Ruiter, um, of the Dutch Navy. And what was wrong with this ship, it has that beacon that you saw it zoomed in uh, a little bit earlier. What happened was we saw this beacon over the whole terrain. Everywhere we went, we were like, I see the, the signal from Michiel de Ruiter, and we couldn't figure out how that happened. 
We knew it's high up, so that, that does something for the signal. It, 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 it's better. What we found out by talking to the Navy is that this ship has a special coding for it not to show up on radar, and that actually is, is some, uh, for some reason, it really uh, bounces off Bluetooth great. So my, my, my thing is that with long-range beacons, you can actually track these types of ships. So that might be a different business model we're pivoting into uh, later on. But um, no, because you have only 300 meters and then you can already see them. But um, th th those are the things that you run into. We, for us, I mean, we're, we're software guys, right? We're not hardware guys. So we, we figure it out in the software and then we, we make sure that you get the right experience. Uh, but it took us two days and talking to the Navy, like what's going on on that ship um, to figure stuff like this out. So to give you a little bit idea of the, um, the stats behind these, uh, these types of things, um, we did 65% uh, uh, of the messages we sent were notifications about ships. Um, uh, you see the open rate is 26%. It's, uh, it's the highest of all. So if you send information, people really respond to it well. If you send uh, information about the terrain, people are like, ah, I don't know if this is, this is really necessary. So the open rate is lower. If you do something with promotions, and these were not really like buy this now or do this now. These were, these were nice, mellow promotions. Um, the open rate uh, goes to 13%. So it's really something that, that we talk to customers about a lot is to say, okay, if you're selling to customers, do it the right way because customers are so savvy. I mean, the consumer is really savvy in seeing if you're trying to sell them on something. Average open rate during the event, so this is not counting like days after because that happens as well. During the event, about 22% of the people opened the message almost immediately. And if you talk about um, algorithms and making sure that it's relevant, um, uh, I spoke about those 8.6 million interactions before. Um, from those 8.6 interactions, we had 336,000 times where we had information to give to that, um, to that person. Um, but we had a, a relevancy uh, algorithm on that uh, in, in different ways. And we actually only send out uh, 71,000 notifications. Um, because those were relevant to the people at that time. So what, what happens is that if, for example, you've already received a message about that ship and you've opened it, we're not going to send it again. Um, uh, so we're going to do, uh, we're, we're not going to, I'm kind of distracted because this is, uh, this is our CTL right there in the, in the back with the Commodore t-shirt. Um, so he's the guy who finds out that Navy ships broadcast beacon signal very well. Um, uh, so uh, we, we try to be as relevant, uh, relevant as possible. One of the things we also found out, and this is, um, uh, we, we can change the notification sounds, right? From the default sound, we can change it to, to any type of sound that we, uh, we'd like. Uh, we use the uh, boat notification horn, which, um, do I have audio turned on? Uh, he's not listening. Um, no, I don't have audio turned on. Psst. Kan je mijn geluid aanzetten van mijn... Thanks. He was listening now. So it sounded like this. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> um, and when we use that sound, we did A and B testing. When we use that sound, uh, it was open 27% more than when we use a, d a default notification sound. So we always say to consumers, think about that, but don't, you know, don't make a big, uh, don't use like 10 different sounds because people will get, go nuts if you do that. Um, uh, but try to be some, do something unique, and that really works with, with opening rates. Of course, one of the things that you can do is follow the crowd, right? You can see where people are walking past beacons. Now, again, fully anonymously, we could see this is, this is um, a, a, a view that we can just generate in our platform um, where you can show a flow how people are walking from beacon to beacon. In this case, it's from a very large terrain, but we do this for supermarkets, for example, to show, okay, somebody's walking into the supermarket, which uh, paths do they take through the supermarket? So um, uh, we can generate things like this, and then if you uh, transpose that on, um, on a map, you get things like this. This is the, uh, the sill terrain of Amsterdam. Um, the starting points were the Veemkade, which was the biggest started point, which is right here. Um, it's the biggest starting point because the central station is right there. For the 100% of the people that we saw here, we only saw uh, uh, about 70% of them back on the end of that, uh, uh, of that part of, of sale. So, you well, people don't fall in the water. You lose people for some reason. They, they just go away or they just walk and they walk back. 
um, uh, about 30% of the people you already lose, but even when you go to the other side of the water, you lose more than 50%. And then if you walk the whole, um, uh, the whole part of sail, uh, it's 34% uh, only does really the whole thing. And in Dutch, we call this a pokken en lopen. Um, so it was really a long walk and it was really busy. So it's, it's, no, it's kind of logical that not everybody gets there, but it's a very nice way for uh, the organization to see how people are using the terrain, what are they doing. This is something that we, we kind of gave live feedback on as well. And in the end, we, we kind of processed all the information. What was really a big thing was Staatsloterij had their terrain over here. So they really talked to, um, uh, afterwards, they, they talked to the SIL organization saying, well, it was a great spot because everybody could see us, but nobody could get there. Um, so these are, these are things you find out afterwards. Um, so they're not going to be on that spot anymore because they're actually building a hotel there. So in five years, it's not going to be available anymore. Um, Talking about beacon networks, because we didn't use only our own beacons. Um, we used the long-range beacons on the ships. We did install about 50 uh, beacons uh, around the uh, area, which was kind of crazy. We used um, uh, little dots from radius networks that are very inconspicuous. If you're going to do something with beacons, try to get them as inconspicuous as possible, because otherwise they get stolen. Um, I know KLM did a big pilot on, on Schiphol, and their biggest problem was that uh, the beacons were getting, uh, uh, kept getting stolen, and they used contact beacons. They're not even as sexy as an Eskimo beacon. So, um, but we, we didn't have any, we ended up not having any, uh, every beacon we placed, we, found, uh, uh, we retrieved. So uh, none of them uh, were, uh, were actually taken away. And we just put them on, um, uh, on actually street signs and stuff like that and put them uh, as high as possible because we're all, it's Bluetooth signal, so you need to take care of, we are all basically a bag of water. Um, and if you have about five bags of water uh, next to each other, it's really hard for Bluetooth signal to go through there. So if you place it a little bit higher, then you get a much better reach for, uh, for beacons. So it's um, uh, things like that that we used. And then uh, the city of Amsterdam has something really cool. They have what they call the beacon mile, and it's actually being exp extended beyond the mile that they originally had. But those are public beacons. Anyone can use those. Anyone can program against them. Um, uh, you can go to their website and just get all the IDs. Um, you can get a development account from our platform, and we just preload the IDs uh, uh, in there so you can start doing stuff with it. And we, we use those beacons as well because they were already there. Um, we did use two commercial networks as well. Exterior Media, who is already um, actually after sale, they became a customer of ours, so that was, that was a, a good thing. Um, they do all the out of home um, uh, out of home advertising, so the the things that you see in bus stops and stuff, you know, the paper advertisements. But all these paper advertisements now are getting beacons in them. So we use that network, uh, which is on the central station of Amsterdam, to have a measuring point over there. And uh, so Wi-Fi is a Dutch startup doing very very great uh, here in the Netherlands and even abroad. Um, but they install Wi-Fi stations for restaurants and bars. And the cool thing was that they added beacons to those, and, and we can tap into that network as well. And what we did with Sail Wi-Fi, for example, is measure how many people that were on the sail terrain actually uh, also ended up going to a bar or a restaurant. So we saw 41% uh, percent of the people who were there at the terrain, we saw them back again in a bar or restaurant. And it's a very logical number because you go there and you need to eat or drink something. Um, but this is very important to both the SIL organization and, um, uh, and the city of Amsterdam because they basically shut down the half of the city and always all of the, all of the people that own businesses in around Amsterdam, they're like, oh my God, and it's costing me a lot of money. And this gave them a really a hard number to show, listen, this is how much more uh, people you're going to get just by us doing this. Um, one of the things that we, uh, that we decided to do early on um, uh, was to, uh, to make s short videos about it and to explain people what we were doing already in the beginning. So we had stuff about um, uh, the app not getting to the App Store in time. We had stuff about not being able to get the long-range beacons. And this was very, um, uh, we, we said to each other early on, we're going to onboard the people um, uh, to show them how hard it is to actually get this to work. Because if we fail, and there was, there was a chance that uh, that stuff was going to fail, right? Um, if we fail, then people will actually be like, well, you know, but they really tried hard, right? 
So, um, and this really worked. Uh, so by connecting and, and by involving people in a personal way, and again, it wasn't a lot of people, you know, it's a couple of thousand people that, that look at this and that, that actually get all that information. But um, uh, uh, like weeks and months after it, people were like, yeah, and I really loved looking at it. So if you do something that's really uh, innovative and, and you're not sure that you're going to make it, be transparent about it. Just write about it, blog about it, vlog about it, whatever. Um, but be transparent about it because you really can, inv by involving people, they can really get on your side and maybe even help you in, the, in some cases. Uh, if you're interested in, in all of the, uh, the stats and more than I showed now, uh, we also made an infograph of all those um, uh, stats. This is um, for what, uh, what we did with sale. I'm going to show you about three more things to show you what we did after sale. Now, if you're just here specifically for sale, you can leave, but uh, please stay because this is cool stuff. Um, we're, for example, working with a startup called Bar Doggy. They, uh, they try to make um, uh, bars and restaurants uh, more social. So you can see where your friends are and which bars to actually place beacons in these bars. But they did something really cool with our API. Um, this is a version of client telling, like, like what I said with uh, seeing who is at the, um, uh, at the place. So this is actually installed uh, in a few um, uh, bars now in Amsterdam, where if you have the Bar Doggy app installed and you have Bluetooth turned on and you're logged into the Bar Doggy app, your name will end up on this screen. So they have that in screens in, in different bars. And then once every so often, um, uh, a wheel of fortune will start spinning. A wheel of fortune will start spinning with those names, and then uh, uh, a lucky winner comes out of it every, and, and it depends upon the bar you're at. Some bars do it every half hour, some do it every 15 minutes. Um, so you get a name out of it, and you win something, right? Somebody wins something. Um, so this is a fun way to involve people, but also a great way of, um, by the way, you need to really run to the bar and go. And <laughs> um, This is a fun way to involve people, but for bars and restaurants, the thing that they love most is to keep people there and keep people drinking. Um, so this is a way, if your name is on that, on that list, you're going to stay there because what if I win? And they do, this is a shot, but um, uh, they do bitter bala and they do all types of things that they give away uh, this way. And it's, it's a cool way of doing this. Um, this is all small scale. Um, this is ramping up uh, to be large scale. Colruyt is a supermarket in Belgium. They have about 270 supermarkets all over Belgium. And what we did with them is uh, they have in every store, they have uh, on average about 11, um, uh, uh, not dynamic signage, but digital signage. So basically screens. And all they do with those screens is they show uh, advertisements on those screens. And they're changed once a week. So they don't really work. Nobody pays attention. They try to put touch screens in there, but nobody wants to go being in a supermarket and using a touch screen. So we propose to them to use uh, beacons with their app. So what happens is um, with the new Colrite app that's being developed right now, um, people can make um, uh, can can tell Colrite their preferences. So if you have a supermarket that has like a loyalty scheme, you already know what people are buying. Colrite doesn't have that in place, so we're just gonna ask people to create their own profile uh, by a answering a couple of questions. And based upon that profile, we're going to change the dynamic signage whenever you walk through the supermarket. So if you uh, prefer a white wine, then we're only going to uh, show you white wine examples. If you prefer wet wine, we're going to show you red wine um, uh, examples. So by, by using that, we can actually change the environment of people who are walking through a supermarket. Um, if there's like 10 people in front of the same screen, we just use an algorithm. Uh, if there's eight people liking white wine, then we're going to show white wine. If there's more people red wine, we're, we'll show them red wine. Um, one of the neat things that we have here in the, um, uh, in the corner is we put a, a beacon also uh, behind the screen. Um, and this is set to immediate. Now, to remind you, immediate is when you hold it very close to the beacon. And we ask people to hold their phone there, and then it's transferred into, they get on their phone, they get a recipe that goes with this wine or goes with beer. This is Belgium, so it's all about wine and beer, right? So um, uh, they get that recipe, and that, that feels magical to people. You hold your phone up to it, oh, all of a sudden it's on my phone, and I think it's beamed to there. This is the easiest uh, thing to do, because all we do is we see that you hold it close, we know uh, on the screen what type of recipe is, is set there, and the recipe is already in your app. So all we do is just pop up that recipe. Um, but people love that because it's a very easy way for them to interact and to get some information with them uh, uh, from that screen. Um, so these are some of the examples we're doing with client telling. 
with remarketing and retargeting, I've, I already gave some examples earlier. We're doing a big thing with uh, Coca-Cola right now um, where they're introducing a healthy energy drink. They exist. Um, a healthy energy drink, uh, uh, Nalu, um, uh, which is being sampled in 15 train stations. Uh, actually, they stopped last week worth the last sampling. They um, give away about 2,500 cans during a sampling. But what happens with that in the past, they don't know what happens, right? They give away the can, and then they're like, oh, we hope you're coming back, bye. Um, so what we did, uh, we outfitted uh, all the people that were doing the sampling with beacons, and also the, the stand itself with beacons, and we made them uh, a very short range. So we only tag people if you actually get a can from the Nalu, uh, uh, from the Nalu people. So we know that you received something, right? So you tried the product. And only if you've tried the product, you're being retargeted in the Telegraph app and also in the uh, Reclame folder app, which I don't know how to translate, but it's, a tra uh, it's, a, it's an app with flyers, basically. Um, so we retarget you in that uh, in one week, and then the next week you get, um, uh, you get a coupon to get it for a, a special price. I think it's half off or something like that. Um, the nice thing for Coca-Cola in this case is that they can actually track if people actually buy the stuff. So first of all, they track um, if you've got it. Then they track if um, uh, this works, because after you've seen the advertisement, this is the part, crucial part that I left out. Uh, we also have beacons installed in the point of sales where they sell um, uh, this stuff uh, at the uh, uh, train station, the kiosk. Um, and so we can see after seeing that advertisement, if you actually go to the kiosk and are in front of the, we can't really see if you buy it, but we can see if you're standing in front of uh, the Nalu stand. So you can still, because Red Bull is right next to it, so you can still buy a Red Bull, but we'll count it that you saw, at least saw Nalu. Um, but with the coupon, we can actually see if you redeem it, so if you, uh, if you actually use it. So this is, this is things we do, and, and the cool thing with Coca-Cola is that they're very uh, digital first, so they're really looking at uh, new projects, new things to do, to try out to see how they can um, uh, influence shoppers' behavior. Uh, last thing I want to show to you is the, the out-of-home uh, retargeting that we're doing. We're doing this with exterior media. So these out-of-home objects in uh, a lot of cities in the Netherlands um, will be outfitted with beacons. We uh, tested this in Alkmaar and Purmerend, where uh, we placed 350 beacons in these advertisements. Uh, so the cool thing is you can make heat maps where it's busiest in the... Um, in those cities. We did a small pilot with Decamarkt with um, uh, about 80 touch points. Uh, they had an advertisement in there uh, in those touch points. If you're next to it, we retarget you with an advertisement. And then we saw if you actually convert towards the, um, uh, towards the supermarket. And the cool thing is we converted a lot of people towards the supermarket. I can't give you that number, unfortunately. But the number I can tell you about is that uh, the click-through rate on this, uh, on this ad was about 400% higher than a usual ad. So people really uh, clicked on it and actually did something with it. So that's, uh, uh, that's something cool. And, and the cool thing is with Xero Media, we're doing this with 350 touch points now in two cities, but this summer they're scaling it up to uh, 6,000 beacons throughout the whole Netherlands. So it's gonna be very interesting to be able to use that network and to, uh, to do things. And, and basically what we do is we deliver the platform, right? We only do the technical stuff behind it. So we leave uh, all the other stuff up. The app developers can just develop their apps. Uh, we make sure that the, the Beacon stuff works. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? I was going to say, I, I, I don't believe for a minute that's it. I think <laughs> I've been listening and the arms are going up already. What's your name and what's your question? Hi, I'm Pierre. Um, I have a, a question regarding privacy again, because, I mean, you must have that all the time. Sure. But... Um, I just think that, I mean, like technology can be good and bad. And in this case, uh, I feel like there should be some legislation around what beacons can do. And as you say, you're just the platform, so you don't, you don't have the responsibility. No, no, but, this, this but is there is a part of responsibility. Yeah. I it's, it's it's not I'm going to interrupt you. Yeah. Technology can be good or bad. Technology is not good or bad. It's how people use it. But it's anyway. It's true. Um. Oh, he's actually going to ask the question now. Yeah. So um, I live in the UK, and I just read the other day on, on the like a magazine that uh, people spend their entire uh, salary on the 17th day of the month. So we live in a society that forces people to consume. Um, 
obviously this kind of like technology is increasing this kind of behavior. So um, I appreciate that you're doing the opt-in only, but like this is opening the gate to much more. How do you feel that you are dealing with this kind of responsibility in your company? And what do you think l like the policies should be to protect people? Um, one of the things that we did, I believe in the sixth month that we started this company was we drafted a code of conduct for all of, of, all of our customers. Um, so co code of conduct says that um, uh, they're not gonna spam people, they're not gonna use the data in, in ways that are evil, so to speak. I mean, it's hard to say what is good and what is evil, but um, so we really try to take responsibility in that. Um, and that was also one of the reasons why a lot of media companies actually said, because they're, believe it or not, they're actually very careful with, uh, with privacy. Um, uh, that's why they started using our platform, because we had that in place. Um, I do agree that um, that this is this is somewhere in in privacy terms. People think of it. Ah, can we do this? And, but it's no different than a cookie on your um, uh, uh, on your browser. It's really no different than a cookie, but only it's physical. So it it tracks where you've been, um, just like you tra you are tracked by Amazon if you go to. Uh, uh, go to the electronics or go to the, C they don't sell CDs anymore, go to the books, uh, things like that. Um, and that's what we do with, uh, with a supermarket. We track that you've entered the supermarket and we see where you're going in the supermarket, only if we have your permission to do so. The evil part is not from us. The evil part is Wi-Fi tracking, Bluetooth grabbing, things like that. Things that are not opt-in are not okay. And you see retailers moving away from that. In the Netherlands, we have much more le legislation that you're not able to actually do that anymore. And I applaud that. That's, that's where it should be, and this should be an opt-in technology. So, But I, we try to be good. We try to be good. <laughs> Another question, perhaps? Who's sitting up looking alert? No, no, the one next to you. Yeah. <laughs> don't, don't panic. But you are next. Hi. Uh, what's your name? What's your question? Hi, I'm Chris. Uh, my question is... How do you nail this sale deal? Good question, uh, because, Chris. I mean, it's we are in a startup yeah. thing, so yeah. And it, and it's like a once every five year opportunity, yeah. right? So did you compete on price or or on quality or whatever? Yeah, we we didn't compete on price. That's interesting. We we never do any pilots for free, and that's that's a free tip before you leave. Free tip: don't do free pilots. Um, because if you don't, if you do free pilots, there will be no buy-in uh, with the customer. So even if it's just a, a thousand or two thousand euros, we always charge for a pilot. Um, where we nailed it with Sill was that there were um, three different uh, sponsors talking to three different companies to do something with beacons. So what Sill did was they were very risk averse. They were like, oh my God, we're not gonna be able to do this because everybody wants to use a different vendor. Stop it, we're not gonna do beacons. Um, but Staatsloterij, um, uh, we already were talking to Staatsloterij and they said, well, we have a company that can actually make sure that a lot of different um, uh, uh, sponsors and still themselves can use, um, uh, can actually use this beacon network. Um, uh, and there is just one point that, that basically manages everything. So that's, that's one of the unique things that we do. We manage different beacon networks and that's none of the competitors have that and still don't have that. Um, so that's, that's what we actually wanted on. We didn't compete on price. Um, Sale didn't pay us. Staatsloterij and another sponsor paid us for, uh, for our work because Sale doesn't have any money. Um, uh, but uh, that's the way we, uh, uh, we got into this deal. So it sounds like we a solved the problem. A little bit of being in the right place at the right time with the right contacts, but then actually adding value. Actually adding value and doing something that others couldn't. Uh, we solved the problem that, yeah, we really want to do something with beacons, but we're afraid that then we're going to have to integrate three SDKs and, and what is that going to do to the interaction? And, and one of the key features that they really triggered on was that um, we can budget how many, um, uh, how many notifications you can receive as, uh, as a visitor. So what they could say is, okay, uh, great, you're paying for it, but you can only send two messages to one visitor. And so we put that budget in, and that way uh, uh, people don't get spammed, because that, that's what they were afraid of, that everybody started bombarding people with messages about, oh, buy this or do that, or um, uh, so that's it. But right time, right place is always a very good place to be.
All right, we've got time for maybe one or two if there are short questions. If there's anybody else, otherwise I'll come back to you. <laughs> no? Second one's for free? Yeah. Hang on one second. What's your name and what's your simple question? My name is Mitch. Uh, my simple question is, because I have no idea, how much do those beacons cost? Uh, they're about anywhere between 10 and, and $30 uh, dollars to, uh, to buy. So they're very cheap. Uh, the long-range beacons are about 70 bucks. Okay. Yeah. So they're, they're a little bit more expensive. That really was a simple question. Cool. <laughs> it, it was. It was uh, we'll come back to you. <coughs> yeah. How is the pricing or how is it? Do uh, you have different kind of models? Could I use it as a small company as well, your technology? Or do you yeah. just... We, um, for, for large corporates, we have, basically, we have a business model uh, just for licensing. So what we do, we have um, uh, uh, a monthly fee, so we have a recurring revenue as, as a startup, and then we have uh, a fee overall and a fee per beacon, because that's where it starts adding up. So if you have, well, if you have a thousand beacons, then you need to talk to us. But if you have like 10 beacons, you'll pay a specific price, et cetera. For startups, like, like Bar Doggy, and we're doing HealthCoin right now, Small startups that you know they don't have a lot of money usually. We uh, we have a, a special startup plan where you get um, uh, I don't know the exact pricing, but I, I can send you an email about it. It's um, uh, it's it's one starter's fee, and and then uh, you pay if you go beyond uh, uh, more beacons. I think it's I think we include like 30 beacons or so. Well, we don't include the hardware, but you can you can use that, and then way we can grow with you. So if you sell the product then uh, we get paid more. If you don't sell the product, then uh, then you don't pay anything, basically. In the startup world, we came with that, the uh, drug dealer method, right? The just drug dealer method. Just try a little bit and see it's how it it's goes. It's really cool. It's exactly. really nice. But, but actually, if you do it on the spirit of partnership, then it's really effective. But if you're interested, just let me know, and I, I can set you up with a developer's account, and we do, um, uh, we do uh, workshops, just free workshops, to show you uh, how the product works and stuff like that. So it's, it's pretty cool. Cool, cool. beats. Remco, are you going to be around uh, Campus Party for another like 10 minutes, hour, 10 minutes, two day, 10 no, days? No, 10, right. 10, 15 minutes, and then, right. uh, so then I'm out of here. If you've got one more question. But Ronald is here as I well. So if you have technical questions, ask him. <laughs> say, if you've got a question, you've got 10 minutes to grab him. I was about to ask his name. Now it's Ronald. Hi, Ronald. How are you? <laughs> How's Campus Party been for you? How has Campus Party been for you? Are you inspired? <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, came all the way from Amsterdam and I have a feeling he's heading all the way back there straight away. And as you know, it's not campus party if you don't sleep in a tent. <laughs> so we're giving you one of our tents to take home with Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe, maybe awesome. you'll use it at home. Maybe you know somebody with kids. Maybe you've got your own. I don't know. Uh, enjoy it. I have a dog. Will it uh, work with it dogs? It depends <laughs> how big the dog is. It's a Weimaran. It's about that Oh, big. no, it'll be yeah. fine. Okay, good. Ladies and gentlemen, please, huge round of applause for Remco. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, sir.